All right, today we're going to be talking about the geopolitical implications of Bitcoin for U.S. national security. I'm here with Natalie Smolinski, the chair of the board for the Texas Blockchain Council. Natalie, thanks for having a conversation with me today. Yeah, my great pleasure. Okay, well, this is sort of a preview for the Texas Blockchain Summit October 8th in Austin, Texas, where there's going to be a panel on this very topic. Natalie will be sitting on that panel along with uh, colleagues from um, elected officials from the U.S. Congress and other uh, parts of the country. So, Natalie, let's let's give the audience a little bit of a preview of what that conversation is going to look like. What's your thesis around um, the national security implications of Bitcoin, Bitcoin mining, the United States versus other um, other nation states? Yeah, no, this is a really important topic for a number of reasons. One is because Bitcoin represents the first true non-state digital currency. So um, it's truly distributed, meaning that no government, um, no industry consortium, no one body owns it, and it has a fixed monetary policy. So what that means is it's going to exist in a trade pair with every fiat currency going forward into, into the foreseeable future. And you know, traditionally, the minting of currency has been the prerogative of the state. Um, so we really need to think through as a country what that means for American state sovereignty and the projection of American power in the world. Hmm. So when we're talking about um, currency pairs and pricing, mm -hmm. is this going to provide a little bit more transparency for citizens in countries where their currency tends to have a higher inflation rate or they're, they're needing to sort of ascertain um, rather than looking at the, the US dollar, dollar pair with their currency, they're actually gonna have a triangulated position right. with a Bitcoin pair as well. Absolutely, in many ways, Bitcoin will serve as a source of truth for value. Um, because it's a currency that can't be uh, easily manipulated, um, it really serves as a kind of reference point, almost like an SDR um, for other currencies. Now, that doesn't mean they're going to go away. That doesn't mean fiat currencies are going away. It does mean, however, that there is kind of a, a balancing effect when it comes to truth around the value of currencies. So should central banks be concerned about this uh, or should they be embracing it? Let me pose that a little bit differently. What about central banks from countries like Argentina and Turkey that have traditionally experienced default, sovereign defaults. Um, is this a reckoning for them? And um, take that from there to the Fed and what the U.S. should be thinking about. Yeah, no, I, I think there's been a lot of opposition from central banks um, to Bitcoin. But I think over the next few years, there will be a dawning realization that it's actually a really great thing. Um, because it gives the citizens of any country that is experiencing hyperinflation or default a safe haven where they can store wealth um, as the political storms blow over. Um, and so Bitcoin may uh, counterintuitively be the thing that prevents the mass social unrest that central banks are trying to prevent through monetary policy. That's a great point. I've never thought of it that way. Okay, so now let's jump to the United States. How can the Fed um, really embrace this to prolong the U.S. dollar's dominance as the world's reserve currency? Yeah, well, you know, this is really where we need to have a debate as a people, as the American people, um, because sometimes there is a trade-off between um, the ability to, say, project American power abroad and the well-being of Americans at home. Um, there's not a correlation between, you know, the, the supremacy or dominance of the dollar internationally versus the well-being of American citizens domestically. And in the past, we've kind of made a trade-off decision that has privileged our ability to extend power abroad. But I think that paradigm is now being called into question. Uh, so I really look forward to, to that debate. Yeah, as do I. Now let's shift the conversation a little bit towards um, the mining side of things. You know, there was a lot of concern that uh, the hash rate in China was growing too large yes. and that the Communist Party could influence Chinese miners to hard fork or to change transactions or something of that nature. Mm -hmm. uh, that's no longer a threat because they've pushed um, the miners out of the country. Right. Um, 
what, where, we're, sort of, we're at this precipice, we're at this moment in history where it's up for grabs almost as to who and which countries are going to be um, sort of the, the epicenter for mining, cryptocurrency mining, specifically Bitcoin mining. What do you think, how important is that for the United States to embrace, or is it important? Mm -hmm. No, I think, it's, I think it's critical from a national security standpoint that the United States embraces Bitcoin mining um, and becomes a destination of choice for Bitcoin mining. Um, that's, that's not to say that I'm calling for you know, the U.S. to have a monopoly over mining. I think it does need to be globally distributed, um, but you know, in the same way that we need uh, a strategic, uh, strategic reserves of all kinds of natural resources, having a strategic Bitcoin reserve and a strategic mining capability is what is going to um, ensure our national interest going forward. Um, so in regards to um, not only mining, but also the, the tendency for nation states to be uh, defensive about these kinds of changes, do you see in the future uh, a nation state attempting to attack the Bitcoin network? Of course, it would have to be a very large nation state. It wouldn't be uh, you know, a, a developing country. Is that a concern? Uh, and if so, what might that attack look like? Danger to Bitcoin from a 51% attack standpoint um, arguably happened in 2017 during the block size wars um, when there was a lot of push, uh, a large push to increase the block size of the Bitcoin blockchain. Um, and because of the hash power that was concentrated in China, um, that a lot of that pressure was coming from Chinese miners. Um, that's simply not the case anymore. Um, I, I think, you know, at this point, a 51% attack against the Bitcoin network is extraordinarily unlikely. What's going to happen is the battle, and I think we've already seen this, the battle has shifted to the on-ramps and off-ramps. Mm -hmm. um, so there will be attempts to impose uh, stringent AML KYC requirements for any transaction or any move uh, translation of Bitcoin into, into fiat currencies. There will be um, crackdowns on miners, perhaps, um, crackdowns on people using uh, the cryptocurrency. Um, but ultimately, you know, I see these as growing pains. I think ultimately, like I said, governments are going to realize that actually having Bitcoin around is in their national interest. Um, it's just going to take time for that realization to sink in. Let me play devil's advocate here for a minute, though. Sure. So what if there, you know, there, there's estimates out there that it would only take $7 billion to do a 51% attack. Hmm. Um, and that's a lot of money for you and me or for anybody in the network, but not a lot of money for the United States or for China or Germany. So would it be possible for some, because you're, you're really just buying hash power, right? Mm -hmm. If the Communist Party says, we're going to buy you know, billions and billions of dollars worth of hash power for the next X period of time in order to attempt to 51% attack the network. Do you think it would be important for like Western nations or traditional allies in the Bretton Woods systems to actually be aware of that potential and be ready to step in and fight that mm -hmm. with countering that hash power with, with financial resources of our own? Yeah. Um, is that something that you could see us being even adept? Right now, we couldn't do it. The U.S. Mm -hmm. government wouldn't be aware that that was even happening. Yeah. But in the coming years, could we be ready for something like that? Yeah, you know, I think that's a great question. Um, and we do need to consider every attack vector and every contingency. So having that um, capital prepared and ready to be deployed in case we did detect attempts at a 51% attack, I think is absolutely strategic. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and the great thing about uh, the Bitcoin network is because it's an open and public chain, you know, we could actually see that attack coming. Um, and so having that, you know, as one of the many, you know, contingencies that we're prepared for, I think is, a, is an important thing. Mm. Yeah. yeah, and I've also read that uh, 7 billion is an extremely low um, hash rate purchase threshold that most security analysts place the, the threshold much, much higher than that because mm -hmm. once you start buying hash rate, demand for hash rate increases. Right. And you could very quickly see that, you know, if you're trying to acquire 51% of the network, that price 
yep. balloon from seven billion to maybe twenty five percent of the total market cap of Bitcoin, which is around you know eight hundred billion at this right. time. So, right. uh, I think that was a extremely uh, low estimate. Yeah. The the estimates that most analysts look at is is obviously much higher than that. But even still, the U.S. Uh, defense budget for a year is six hundred billion dollars. Mm -hmm. So not that any one country could train that amount of capital right. to attack the network. Um, but things that we should be thinking through, things that I think yeah. the Department of Defense should be thinking through. Right. Well, and ultimately, it's going to come down to, I think, a cost-benefit calculus for any nation that does want to attack the network. Because, mm -hmm. you know, um, a, a stateless, uh, self-sovereign currency, you know, it, it is a threat to authoritarian regimes. Um, but it also has benefits, and in terms of the many enemies that they could go after and their strategic goals, you know, I, I would I would see them actually more likely to prioritize the low-hanging fruit. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, this is one of those species-level initiatives. Bitcoin is um, that you know, much much like the space program. Uh, has already gotten a kind of international web and network of people cooperating and collaborating, um, it's going to become harder and harder to make the case that this is not a critical element of human infrastructure. Mm -hmm. I agree 100 percent. Yeah. What am, I, what am I not thinking to ask you that the audience here needs to be thinking through as we kind of coalesce um, the cryptocurrency community in the United States to be uh, putting the, the positive kind of pressure on our elected officials to, to take these kinds of things seriously. What, what will be your message to that audience? Yeah, I, I think my message right now is come think with us. That's the purpose of the Texas Blockchain Summit. We don't have all the answers right now. We are in the early stages of a profound social transformation and we need the best of humanity to step up and join us join the Brain Trust, and help us think through how to move through this transition. And, and we have speakers coming to the summit that will do exactly that. We'll be on stage with um, the likes of Senator Ted Cruz, Senator Cynthia Lummis, Senator John Cornyn, mm -hmm. SEC Commissioner Hester Peirce, uh, the CEOs of some of the largest Bitcoin mining companies in the world, just to name a few. Yep. That's so. right. No, we, we got an, an A-plus lineup uh, here for, for both beginners and seasoned uh, cryptocurrency industry veterans. Regardless of your level of understanding or knowledge, um, this is the place to be. Couldn't have said it better. Yep. Thanks for joining me for this conversation today, and I look forward to continuing the conversation at the summit. Yes, thank you. And we hope to see you all there as well.